So first of all, let me congratulate the organizers of this two-day event and wholeheartedly thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for the honor they bestowed upon me by inviting me here. Before I begin my talk, I'd like to say a few words about the Greek National Opera, particularly for our non-Greek guests. The Greek National Opera is the largest cultural organization in Greece producing original cultural works. Uh, the Greek National Opera was founded back in 1942 and is this country's only opera. So today it has to achieve something which at first sight appears to be rather paradoxical. It has to continue to develop and produce the most complex and most expensive type of show, i.e. the opera, in a country which is trying very hard to avoid uh, economic collapse. This is truly a very difficult task, uh, and this seems to be a battle uh, without uh, any uh, possibility of success. Today, however, we will shed light on the positive side of the situation, and we firmly believe that the crisis can lead us down new creative paths. In the current phase, there are three main issues which affect us. First of all, we have the reduction in the public's purchasing power. This has resulted in the public becoming very careful when selecting all types of shows and spectacles it attends. Secondly, we have the major change in the urban environment which has come about from the economic crisis. This has led to changes in social cohesion, there's a sense of insecurity and symptoms of depression in a large part of the population. And we also have a growing crisis of values whose consequences are more far-reaching than those of the economic crisis. These three factors have shaped the artistic planning process followed by the Greek National Opera. So. Firstly, as far as the traditional repertoire of the opera, operetta and ballet, we are seeking to introduce fresh viewpoints in terms of stage directions and music. We are providing a forum for artists who have never before worked with a GNO, allowing them to present their proposals on stage. We are collaborating with young and well-acclaimed Greek and foreign soloists and directors, whilst providing an outlet for new artistic creations via competitions for the composition of new modern works of opera. We are selecting famous operas, we uh, have brought operas that have not come to Greece before or are not frequently presented in Greece while it's also investing in achieving outstanding artistic results. Secondly, as of now, we are organizing the opera's inter international relations with other opera houses abroad for a cultural laissez-faire, laissez-passer approach. So we are planning co-productions which will A, reduce costs, and B, allow for fertile artistic dialogue which will benefit the audience. We also invite back uh, major Greek artists who have uh, excelled in opera houses abroad while we're also supporting the endeavors of our own performers to participate in international production. Thirdly, we are taking a more outward-looking approach and expanding the range of our cultural offerings with artistic activities that seek, at the very least, to ensure that the public comes into contact with us away from traditional venues in the street and in squares on the metro, in places where you would least expect it. Through a series of specially selected activities, we approach social Social groups which for different reasons have never fallen under the charm of the opera. Performers from the opera are leaving uh, behind uh, well-established uh, venues. They sing arias in squares. They sing on uh, op open-topped buses that are moving around the city streets while dancers from the corps de ballet are putting on performances uh, in rundown areas. In addition, the suitcase opera artistic program allows us to present famous operas from a different perspective in unexpected venues. The suitcase opera is flexible. It makes no concession when it comes to quality and brings the art of opera to a wider audience. In unexpected venues, the story of famous operas is told with a piano rather than an orchestra, using sets that can fit in a simple suitcase. Using the GNO exceptional singers, the suitcase opera leaves behind the Olympia Theatre and travels to various neighborhoods of Athens in order to meet a new audience and enchant them. These 
days, the Suitcase Opera is traveling to ancient theaters in partnership with the Diazima Association. When the new artistic season begins with a generous donation from the Stavros Nyarjos Foundation, um, the GNO will commence its program by approaching an even larger audience since it will now be able to travel to areas outside Athens. So we aim to make people more familiar with opera as an art form and to encourage them to embrace our theater. So we want people, as I said, to become more familiar with opera and to embrace our theater. So fourthly, we are investing in training via special programs. In 2012, the program entitled Interactive Opera at Primary Schools, which is financed by the National Strategic Reference Framework, began to be implemented at 70 primary schools nationwide. So during a period of two days of intensive rehearsals, school pupils mimic the process of producing an opera by participating in the preparation of costumes and sets and as members of the choir in an opera performance. In parallel, the opera studio is helping us to prepare tomorrow's soloists through a seminar taught by outstanding professionals from the world of opera while by setting up a children's choir, we're also investing in the voices of tomorrow. They even told me today that there are 90 people that have been selected because we auditioned children, so 90 have been chosen to participate in the children's choir. We all know the great difficulties Greece faces today. At the Greek National Theatre, we've cut down on expenditure considerably. And let me tell you how we managed to save money without affecting the artistic result. So we have uh, actually tried to save money, as I said, uh, without affecting the artistic results. So what we're trying to do is to create smarter productions, while at the same time we're also implementing a general cutback in administrative expenditure. In many cases, a production may be expensive, yet look cheap. But uh, it's also possible that produce, production excuse me, can look fabulous without really being expensive. At the present time, we are reversing the negative balance of our books. Unfortunately, we uh, were suffering losses. And uh, what we've done now is we've stopped any new deficit being formed. Uh, we used to have large deficits. This is no longer the case. So we're trying to improve things. And let me tell you a little bit about the management of the organization over the last one year and a half. So let me just give you some figures. In 2008, the GNO's running costs were 33 million euro. We had 810 people on our staff, and the payrolling cost was around 21 million euro. By the end of 2011, from 33 million, we've gone down to 23 million as far as running costs are concerned. And uh, in 2008, 2012, our running costs uh, will go down by 1 million and will be around 22 million. And uh, on the 31st of December 2011, we had a staff of 519 people and the payroll cost was 14 million. So we had a large accumulated uh, debt. Uh, this debt was around 17 million at the start of 2011. Right now, the accumulated debt has fallen. It's, it's around 7.5 million. Those were the figures last April. At this point, I'd like to stress that the reduction in the deficit was not achieved only by the extraordinary grants that were provided for which we undergo strict auditing, but because of a haircut we managed to agree on with our creditors and we brought down the initial debt. There was a debt right down and now our debt is down by 40 percent. So we convinced them about the need uh, for the country's only opera to survive and the need uh, to restart the organization. So we succeeded in achieving a major reduction in the debt via those negotiations, and I'm sure there's more to come. So according to reports we submitted to the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Finance, we expect, expect excuse me, the debt to be paid off in 2013 if grants continue to flow in without problems. Now, sponsorship. One of the main priorities of management is to create a well-organized fundraising department, which is unprecedented. We never had a, such a department in the past. Now, the mere fact that Stavros Nyarkos Foundation is not only financing construction of the new building, 
but will also finance staff training in the, in, in the field of fundraising has been a catalyst in our endeavor. Of course, no large organization can survive on sponsorship alone. We need government grants, but it is critical to find ways to attract more sponsors, not only by offering incentives, but also by taking a maximalist perspective about the extent of GNO's social role and what it can offer to society. So what we need is to carry out a cultural attack and not to, to uh, show that we can't deal with a crisis uh, and allow the fear to get the most of us. So the GNO's opening up to society is a necessary condition, not just for its survival, but also for the day after. The GNO has set in motion a dynamic that uh, it did not even know it had itself in the past. So history has shown that crises inspire art. And this is perhaps a good time for us to redefine our needs, our values, our aesthetic criteria, and our requirements when it comes to entertainment. This year, the GNO increased the number of productions considerably. It organized a system of ticket selling in advance. It became more outward looking in its advertising approach. It reduced its borrowing cost and presented a primary surplus for the first time ever. In 2015, GNO will move from the classic Olympia Theater in Academia Street to the new facilities at the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Cultural Center in 2016. The Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Cultural Center is the largest development project in Attica since the Olympic Games. The GNO will stage at least 180 performances a year at these new facilities in a hall seating 1,400 via an organization which will offer something just under 600 jobs there by acquiring the position it truly deserves for the country's only opera. By way of information, I would mention that the number of performances and activities implemented by the GNO last year rose to 180 from the former figure of 100. And this year, the number will be 230 by the end of July. At my recent meeting with Renzo Piano in Paris, I had the chance to see and was also delighted to learn about the exceptional potential the new opera house and the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Cultural Center in general have to offer. In 2016, Athens will have a venue which will combine leisure, education, and art. So the emerging prospects are truly exciting, and the Greek National Opera is ready to rise to the occasion and offer artistic works capable of embracing a much wider audience in terms of social background, but also age. At this, uh, on this occasion, let me wish Mr. Trochopoulos every success in his mission because uh, he has a lot of challenges to meet. So we also believe in the new artistic talents this country has to offer. And it is no coincidence that many Greek opera singers are well-renowned abroad and via a well-organized range of various activities and directions, we will be able to achieve our goals. These will be actions which will offer the family, young people, and students the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Culture Center as a destination so that they can spend numerous hours in the park, in the opera, and in the library. The activities in the main hall and secondary hall will combine the need for modern artists to find a creative outlet with opera as an art form. So there are many possibilities. I'm talking about the possible combinations of the opera house and the library and park. So dear friends, I believe that we can come out of this crisis stronger. We will be winners. I'm very optimistic. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Mr. Mikhailidis and now Mrs. Pertsinidou from Praxis. Hello and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you. Thank you, Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, for giving us the opportunity to present our work. But mostly, thank you for entrusting us to uh, also drive this project uh, through in such a moment and in such, uh, with uh, so many challenges ahead. I, I'm, my name is Ioan. I'm working for Praxis. And who is Praxis? Praxis is a non-governmental organization that has a history that uh, 
It was founded in, back in 2004. However, it has an experience of 16 years since it inherited a previous project that MSF used to run and uh, since 2004 managed to expand those projects in a more cohesive and social uh, projects addressing and actually serving over 25,000 beneficiaries uh, per year now with 120 employees and currently running 31 humanitarian projects. There is a variety of projects uh, with a medical component and a social component as well, including public health projects, uh, children on the move, hepatitis and HIV rapid tests, uh, mobile units and mobile school, using uh, and uh, also providing uh, uh, home and shelter apartments to those who are applying for asylum seekers and uh, refugees. Traditionally, you would say that uh, the core target group of uh, praxis have been uh, migrants without papers, without documents. However, over the last years, it was uh, observed a, a, a switch on those who needed the services of the organization, including uh, homeless, including those who vulnerable groups within the Greek society, such as single parent families, uh, uh, women that were victims of trafficking, and uh, so on. So we have uh, started observing quite early, let's say, the change at least uh, of the context by those who have to serve in our polyclinics. There have been said a lot about the context in Greece, and I think I will just try to to focus a bit on the on kind of figures that uh, have been uh, not necessarily uh, addressed. Uh, that was a research uh, that was done uh, in uh, 2011 by an organization that uh, at least uh, provided uh, quite, let's say, reliable statistics. Yes, uh, ime. Uh, so according to this research, nine out of the ten Greek households have uh, experienced a reduction in their income and uh, that reduction was reaching up to 30 percent. Another significant, let's say, uh, indicator that we had to pick up, it was that uh, they were expecting a harsher reduction through 2012 and almost uh, nine out of 10 households could not, uh, let's say, supply their home with uh, basic uh, stuff if there was an increase in uh, the prices observed. 45% um, uh, increase in uh, suicide uh, rate, which is a, a significant uh, increase, along with the 80% uh, uh, horizontal cuts in uh, the mental health uh, uh, sector. Um, I think uh, these pictures we were not uh, very much used to, at least uh, in Athens. I wouldn't put it in uh, the past. Athens not just has changed, is changing, and the point is that uh, we are in the current transition phase that we don't know where it leads us, and that is, let's say, this insecurity and this uncertainty is what is concerning us most. Also, the, the Greek uh, family has changed and is changing, of course. And definitely the Greek reality is changing, and this is, let's say, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have to all face uh, ahead. So what, what we do about it? Um, before we start uh, presenting, it was uh, an initiative that came with the experience of uh, Stavros Nachos Foundation to come along with uh, certain uh, uh, support for uh, a project that actually aim to alleviate the difficulties in the families, in the population, and with the obligation to provide what we should be obviously, let's say, considered being accessible to everybody. And that was actually the core and remains the core idea of the project that we currently run with the support of Stavros Niachos Foundation, and this is since uh, Stoplin, which actually implies in English uh, plus to minus. Uh, I think it's important to uh, explain that uh, the project as such has, a, let's say, dual character. One of the components, it's, uh, it's implemented in dual axis. One of the projects is, one of the components uh, aims at intervening in the actual situation, and that is by creating three-day centers that offer very basic, let's say, services like the uh, 
possibility for someone to take a shower, to wash his or her clothes, to have uh, access to very emergency medical care, and also to uh, have psychosocial support and be, let's say, connected via network with other organizations if there are further demands, even with other services that the uh, praxis in itself provides, among others. Uh, I would like here to make a small parenthesis because there were certain figures heard this morning uh, from the very first uh, foundation. I think one of our biggest concern and issues is the fact that we lack data so we can really plan and design projects that will address the needs and that's core. Uh, the figures that are provided are, let's say, apart from the research that, let's say, Eurostat is doing annually in collaboration with Hellenic Statistic Authority to address the living conditions of Greek households. I don't know any other reliable, let's say, research that can address really figures in terms of homelessness. Only recently, the definition of homeless was accepted by the Greek legislation, and uh, we have no clue whether the homeless, roofless, in Athens and Piraeus are 11,000. Definitely, these are figures that are provided for the people that are going and taking food from municipality and the church. So. Uh, with all this, let's say, uh, question mark on how, how big is the problem actually and what exactly do we need to address it, one of the indirect targets of goals of the specific project is actually to register in collaboration with other organizations the real needs, uh, the real number of uh, homeless and somehow establish in collaboration with the rest a systematic monitoring system so we can enable ourselves to follow up having a, let's say, baseline data, enable ourselves in a process to monitor the changes because we are observing changes, we are, observe, we are observing them empirically, we see them happening, but we cannot really have a clue how big these changes are and in this moment how radical they are. They are, they are a point of increasing. The second act of the project goes to uh, Greek families and has a preventive character and preventive aim. It gets the families in their homes before they lose it, before they get homeless, and tries to create a safety net and tries to put those families back on track so not to lose their autonomy. We're talking for families that have experienced an, a decrease in their income. They have no more, their, let's say, the resources. They are starting piling uh, uh, debts around their households. They might be putting their families at risk to lose the house they, they hold. So uh, the second component of the project, named Kinoniki Katikia, English translation is social housing, but does not really reflect to the common use of the term in we do not provide shelter under certain conditions. We try to keep people and families in their home. And what we try to do through this project is that we provide a short relief in terms of finances. That means supply, uh, supplement to the rent, to supermarkets, to daily, let's say, needs, to electricity bills, and so on, and that is the one side. And the second side is to actually uh, provide through working counseling the opportunity to go back in the market. And they're equally important. The average duration of a family in the project is three to six months. Uh, you may realize that uh, this is a new project and this is how we start. And uh, we try to find also innovative ways to get people really back on the track and in the market. Um, yeah, I was late to change the slides. But uh, how we try to do it, we try throughout the, both projects to use uh, tools that uh, will enable us to follow up our budget, to follow up our indicators, to measure our impact using uh, uh, specific uh, guidelines for the methodology used to, let's say, implement the projects using specific tools to select, to recruit people that are going to be employed in the projects and really systematically measuring the success through the indicators we have initially placed. I must say that it has been a challenge and still is uh, for both projects to see how they evolve and we are flexible enough thanks to the support 
and to the constant, let's say, um, uh, dialogue that we have been enabled with the SNF to really adjust the criteria according to the needs and to really reflect on the needs of the people that we are facing. Perhaps the most scary thing is that recently we had, uh, what we recently experiencing is that we are experiencing more and more families on an emergency situations. Families where they have their children kicked out with their furniture in the, in the yard of their home or on the street and really remaining without uh, any kind of support. We had at least for 10 cases that we had to immediately somehow pick them and force them and support them to get a house and a rent and start working counseling so they get back, let's say, on the track. What we consider, I think many, many of uh, those who have uh, presented uh, throughout uh, this uh, conference talked about synergies and the need uh, really to build, uh, to bridge our strengths and to build and to think uh, positively and to join forces into reaching uh, common goals. I think uh, uh, I would just firmly support all whatever has been said in this direction and also what we face through our efforts to also get synergies around is that we need to also be flexible on what people are able to support with and how really we value and use it for the benefit of the project and actually for the benefit of the people we we do serve. I think in uh, most critical moment, uh, advocacy should also be a core element that should move forward. And there, I think uh, NGOs, nonprofit organizations, and foundations with experience and data could also promote, let's say, things that, in issues, address issues that could at least um, somehow contribute towards affordable solutions because that's the aim at the end of the day. Definitely this is not supposed to be a welfare program, definitely this is not supposed to substitute the states, but definitely we cannot afford living people really uh, deteriorating day by day and simply observing because we don't understand where our limit of intervention may be. I think uh, through collaboration, through bridging our strengths, we can really find solutions and really clarify our roles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. I think I stressed you with the time constraints, but that was all inclusive. Mr. Stereos Sifnios from SOS Children's Villages. Thank you very much for inviting me to this two-day event. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'd like to thank Stavros Nyarchos, uh, not just for that, but also for allowing us uh, to talk one another and to tell you about our experience, the experience from the front line, because we're really working very hard to support the family. So uh, SOS Children's Village is an international organization. It's a non-profit organization. It uh, has been operating uh, since uh, 1992 in Greece, and the main aim is to provide support to children and to help uh, families with child care, families that are undergoing a crisis. So these are all very important matters. This organization is well known because we take care of children, children that are placed in our care, children that have to leave their family for many reasons. Some of them are social problems and so on and so forth. So the international organization decided uh, to organize an international project which was proactive, preventive, so that children can be kept at home. What we wanted to do was to support the family so that the children can stay home in the care of their parents. This was called Family Strengthening Program. It uh, was in the third world that it was implemented, but also in Europe, and slowly and tentatively in 2007, we had created a center which called it Center for the Support of Children and Families in order to help these families keep their children and uh, not have to give them to somebody else. 
to raise you know, in 2009, 2010, but this was mainly in the summer of 2011. We now have a completely new challenge ahead of us, and all of a sudden, uh, in brackets, we see that the requests for help uh, coming to us uh, have become a flood. They no longer a trickle, and in 2011, we had a 100 increase percent of requests compared to 2010. At the same time, we suddenly realized that the largest number of these requests is not just due to societal reasons, uh, but uh, we now have another enter a matter, excuse me, we're talking about uh, parents uh, with financial problems and they come to seek help. So these families come to us and they say to us, look, we don't have the money to support our kids. We can't provide what is necessary to our children. So please take them to your care or please help us help our children. And let me say from the outset, these families don't come to give their children and place them in our care. They come to ask for help so that they can keep their children at home. We don't have cases where a family just abandoned its child at our doorstep because they couldn't raise their child. What do we what we have is more and more families coming to our doorstep asking for financial help. So this was the problem that we encountered. And let me say that from us or from elsewhere, there is no official survey proving that this increase of requests is linked to the crisis, the economic crisis. Uh, so uh, this is an empirical analysis. It is not uh, scientific-based or evidence-based. So bearing this in mind, what we see in Athens is that suddenly the number of cases has skyrocketed. So we suddenly think that something needs to be done in order for us to help these families. And what we need to do is to organize the family strengthening program in a better way so that we can increase the number of ha families that can receive support from us because what we want to do is act preventively. Unfortunately, a village, uh, SOS Children's Villages, uh, is uh, an organization that had no uh, grants from the state. Unfortunately, there's a new law on taxing uh, NGOs. So we are now being taxed, which means that our revenue has gone down. So in the midst of the crisis, the increase in the centers like the one we had in Athens and the fact that we want to help more families, well, it seemed impossible or near impossible. We had done our programming, our planning. We asked management to have six such programs programs in Greece nationwide, but we didn't have the funds to implement six projects. Uh, and then we had the great financial support by Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. So they have given us the opportunity to implement these projects and help all these families. These are projects that will support these families and keep their kids at home. So the help was invaluable. So we started organizing five more, not just the one in Athens, five more programs. I'm talking about family and children support centers. So what are these uh, children and family support centers? Let me try to give you an example. I'll mention a case of a family here in Athens so that you can just idea, get an idea of how we work and what we do. So we're talking about um, a family. We're talking about a mother, a father. They're both unemployed. The father uh, used to uh, paint houses. He hasn't worked for two years. He's been unemployed for two years. They have three girls, three daughters. So they come to our center and ask for help, material support. The first thing we do is we talk to the couple and then we start talking to the kids as well. So what we do is we carry out uh, research in order to see whether the only problem they face is a financial problem. Now, in this specific family, it was quite clear that there was a financial problem. You could tell just by looking at them, by looking at their house and so on and so forth. But while we were talking to them and while we were talking to the children, we also realized that it's not uh, just uh, the stress that this family was suffering from because of the crisis, but the children are also being abused on top of that. So our job is on the one hand 
to try and offer material support, i.e. to help them and alleviate their suffering for as long as we can and to take the material um, problems away from them. But on the same time, we also want to provide counseling and we want to provide psychological support as well. And maybe together with other organizations, we can try and deal with the other problem. I'm talking about the relationships between the different members of the family. Why did I cite this example? I did so because in order for you to truly provide support to a family that is under crisis, that is poor, it's not enough to give them food. It's not enough to give them money. You have to give them support in all the fields they need support. Psychologically, you need to offer counseling, you need to help the kids with their schooling, and you need to help them with all their needs. And of course, what you need to do is to have a team of experts who will intervene when necessary. So we had a lot of such cases. We're talking about Greeks, uh, Greek families, but we're also talking about uh, migrants as well. Uh, families where there is uh, no uh, drug abuse, for example, the parents uh, do not have serious mental health problems, uh, and we're talking about families where the children don't have psychological problems either. So here in Greece, we have six such uh, children and family support centers, the one in Athens, the one in Alexandropolis, in Kalamata, Thessaloniki, Heraklion, and Komotini. So six in total, four are foreign friends. Let me tell you that this means that uh, we cover the whole of Greece, uh, from northern Greece all the way down to southern Greece and Crete. So we're trying to provide coverage all over Greece. Now, let me just give you some final figures and facts. Right now, the main aim in Athens is to support 300 families, and in the other centers, we're talking about 150 to, for example, the Saloniki and the smallest uh, center, which will support 40 families. But in practice, the Komotini Family Support Center, which was supposed to support 40 families annually in two months, it already supports 40 families, which means that we will support a lot more families than the ones we had originally expected, which means that we need to revise our planning. Now, let me give you the profile of cases that we are looking at. Let's talk a little bit about Athens, about uh, what happened from the 1st of January to the 30th of June. Right now, we have 150 families being supported by our center. This means that we are offering help to 536 people. So we have parents, we have 284 children in total out of this number. 54% are Greek, 46% uh, are foreigners. 387 of these people receive material support from us, material help. Now for 183, there's psychosocial support. 57 of these families are single parent families. And 35% are families with a lot of children, with many children. So these are the efforts we've undertaken right now together with the um, help of others. So we're trying to also help children that cannot live with their families. We have three SOS children's families, villages all over Greece, which care for children. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Before we move on with uh, the second group of the organizations, are there any questions for the representatives of uh, the Greek National Opera, Praxis, and SOS Children's Villages? Any other comments that you would like to make? Thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to, to call Mr. Bartsokas from the organization Together for Children. Mr. Kambanis, representing the Initiative for Heritage Conservancy. And Mrs. Tamati for the Museum of Greek Children's Art. As, uh, as far as the Initiative for Heritage Conservancy is concerned, Mr. Kambanis is representing the organization today. 
Um, Mr. Kiryaki, this was supposed to be here with us today, but unfortunately uh, there was a force majeure and he couldn't. But he has prepared a video and uh, sent it to us so that we can watch this later on. And Mr. Kambanis will be the one answering any questions. Thank you. Well, I'm very grateful to have been invited to talk about the Together for Children Union of 10 charity organizations for children. And you got an introduction from the last speaker speaking about the SOS villages, which are part of our group of uh, charity uh, organiz associations. The uni Union of Together for Children was organized 1996 because we realized that there were several non-profit, non-governmental organizations who were collecting small amounts of money here and there, and they had to split all their efforts, and they were not as successful as a unity. Uh, being together, we were much more successful in getting the funds and dividing exactly to those 10 charities which form the administrative board of um, the union. The organizations which form the Together for Children take care of over 10,000 children and their problems. You see, being poor is a problem which has consequences in even um, cultural, mental development, leading sometimes to criminal actions, but it's even worse if you are sick and, uh, and poor. And um, several of the associations we have deal with diseases of children, chronic diseases like diabetes. When we started, there were no organized diabetes care for children. Parents felt lost when they were leaving the hospital. There was no 24-hour care and diabetes is there for 24 hours. You have complications. Then there were uh, children with cerebral palsy that needed rehabilitation. There was no state rehabilitation center until the one that the Nyarkos Foundation donated to the Aglaia Kiryaku Children's Hospital in Athens. There were also other associations for Ment mentally retarded children, and the case was until 20, 30 years ago that the institutions for mentally retarded actually were deposits of children entering and losing half of their IQ within, within one year because there was no special care, special education. So we have these 10 organizations whose aim was uh, to avoid social exclusion public awareness, and uh, to prevent domestic violence, which was occurring in many of these poor families. Poverty, as I mentioned to you, is a problem, and now it's getting even worse, because all our organizations rely on donations by private people, private foundations. There are people who, instead of presents in their wedding or a christening of their child, prefer to donate this amount to the union together with children. Uh, I think we contributed to uh, public awareness for charity. We have many volunteers and services, even from young people who are students or newly graduating from their uh, colleges. We are collaborating with domestic and foreign um, organizations, similar organizations. We try to support the research, and our main activity, once a year at least, sometimes twice, we have a big event at the Herodis Atticus Theater for the past four or five years, which was the event of the Together for Children. We were able to fill the theater, 5,000 spectators, and the money we collected was distributed again equally to the 10 charities. Now, where does the Nyarhos Foundation come? We owe a tremendous gratitude to the Nyarhos Foundation because 
they offered at the Aglaia Kiriakou Children's Hostel through us the intensive care unit. We owe them the development of the nephrology unit, the kidney machines, etc. And their main contribution for the past three years was the foundation of the first public rehabilitation center for children with spasticity, with you know, following accidents, which uh, costed, I think, to the foundation about one and a half million euros. I shouldn't say the price, but you know, for Greece, this was a big success because in two floors, it has everything from a pool to uh, all the equipment we need. In addition to those, for the next two years, the Nyarkos Foundation will be supporting, we have a helpline, 11525. This um, works 24 hours a day, and children or parents can call for any problem dealing with, it, with everyday life, violence, or uh, problems that can be solved by our social workers or psychologists in one-to-one -one, um, discussions. Sometimes they call two or three times because they, they got so reassured and satisfied with the service of the center. There we have several volunteers. It's amazing how many people want to help other people. I couldn't believe that because, you know, we Greeks are, uh, we like to have some profit from what we do. And the only profit they have is an annual free ticket for transportation in buses and the metro in Athens so that they don't have any charges to come and work for us. Now, we have to fight the government. And we had to fight also for the Nyarkos Foundation supported rehabilitation center um, by having press conferences. And I can tell you that through the support of the media, a TV station and uh, their staff in the newspaper, they have, the minister had to appoint the personnel we needed for the rehabilitation center. Um, deputies in the government who attended, in the parliament, who attended those uh, press conferences made formal uh, questions to the ministers who had to be answered. So I, I think we have contributed a little more to charity and we owe very much of our existence to the volunteers, to the friends, but most to the Nyarkos Foundation who has been supporting us for the past uh, maybe 10 years, and I hope they'll continue to do it in the future. Thank you. The Nyarkos Foundation for inviting us to speak about the, what we learned on the sustainability of organizations through the three years we've been running the Initiative for Heritage Conservancy. Leonidas Campanis uh, will be available for comment at the end of this talk. And I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Uh, one of the first things is, uh, that are important uh, is a clarity of purpose. The Initiative for Heritage Conservancy aims to promote best practice in the management of heritage through education and research programs. We think that heritage sites are non-renewable resources of education, culture, local pride, social coercion and sustainable developments for local communities in a worldwide context. By having a clear definition, this means that we can say no to all unwanted and irrelevant work. And another most important feature um, is addressing a crucial need uh, that has been sensed by society. As I said, hated is a non-renewable resource. It is crucial for the well-being of individuals, societies uh, and whole countries. Um, on them, their um, heritage is the material predicate uh, for the uniqueness of these societies and for the pride of these societies. 
So if you neglect the preservation of this heritage uh, because of lo uh, budget cuts, you risk losing the identity and uniqueness of local communities. You risk losing uh, what you have been fighting for uh, with these budget cuts. And so in essence, you really need to make sure that heritage is continuously protected so that it is always there. This is an example from Korea. Now it's common knowledge that uh, most sites do not represent what they should be uh, for society. They are not, what we said in the beginning, a source for identity, for, for culture, education, uh, social coercion, local pride, sustainable development for local communities and in a worldwide context. If you couple that with a dwindling resource that is invented for, I invested for currently for the protection, management and preservation of cultural heritage and with a policy for creating more and more open air sites that are open to the public um, so newly excavated sites that are important are open to the public this means that you have a recipe for disaster without a paradigm shift in the management of heritage because you have a growing demand for the protection of sites a growing demand for the better uh, planning and display of sites while you have a dwindling resource for their protection. Now, whatever we do, we make sure that we have a sustainable mentality. We are sustainable because that's what we want to do. And so the crisis is not, only, is not irrelevant, of course, uh, but it's more of an opportunity where um, competition wanes rather than an incentive to be sustainable. So we don't start anything new unless we have the capital to ensure that we're doing what we're doing forever. Um, we do not create new liabilities. We use a lot of volunteers and interns. And all programs have to ensure income uh, uh, before we expand them. And all programs have to be unique. Now, some, some of our programs uh, a new uh, MA in heritage management, a think tank in climate change and its impact on preservation management of sites, uh, a 3D recording and visualization, uh, digital recording and visualization, uh, some projects. Um, now, all these programs have to have a mentality for excellence. Uh, they have to be new and cutting edge in a worldwide context, not a national context. Uh, we have a leading academic committee that checks all of them and ensures the academic prowess, their academic prowess. And we create leading pr uh, partnerships in each program and have very high ambitions, again, in an international context, not a national one. High quality partnerships have been crucial to our sustainability because they save money by bringing in their own contributions. They save time by not having to reinvent the wheel they propel the quality of our programs and these partnerships are also beneficial for all our partners. Now, creating capital has been very important, uh, both for the safety of the sustainability of the organization, but also for the insurance that we can continue doing what we do well forever. So we fundraise only for things that we know we can deliver. We're not allowed to create deficits in the long term, maybe one or two years, but not longer. We try to uh, fortify the blue sky donations, donations that have not come with an agenda, uh, they are there because they like our organization and these are the most valuable we have found and um, we do not mind if we fail 
uh, but we try to endow all the programs that we are successful in. And of course we need to decide what sort of organization we are. Are we a grassroots organization? An intermediary advocacy organization? This is the case for the Initiative for Heritage Conservancy. Or um, a governmental organization, an institution, a grant giving organization. We're neither the first nor the last and this affects our structure. We uh, have followed these principles so that we can actually build and construct something. And so our next aim is to fully endow our 3D recording and visualization uh, summer project, whereby we both teach expertise on these uh, techniques, but also we try to safeguard heritage and create new applications um, for heritage management through 3D recording and visualization. Thank you, and for more information, you can always write an email um, to our email addresses uh, e.kiriakidis at kent.ac.uk or info at heritage.org. Or for more information, you can find all that in our website. Thank you, and Leonidas Kambanis uh, will take some questions now. Hello to everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm last, but actually I'm going to talk about something that it's, it's first and it's common to everybody. It has to do with child and it's international language. I'm talking to English, I'm Greek, but art is an international language. So on behalf of the members of the board of the Museum of Greek Children's Art, I wish to thank the Stavros Niachos Foundation for the opportunity to present the museum's activity, which are largely linked with the foundation's donation. The Museum of Greek Children's Art is a pioneering museum, one of the few such institutions worldwide that exhibit drawing and three-dimensional artwork created by children, focuses on learning through art, thus presenting an innovating museum school model. The museum's primary aim since its establishment in 1994 was the development of its educational activities, an objective that was not part of most museums' philosophy in Athens at that time. The fundamental difference between the Museum of Greek Children's Art and other institutions offering children's activities is that our museum draws all its activities from the child derives from the child, is addressed to the child, and promotes the child's creativity. A non-profit cultural association, the museum, during the last 18 years, realizes educational programs for school groups, artworks for workshops for children and people with special needs, family programs, and seminars for educators. Drawing from its collections of over 5,000 artworks, the museum presents exhibitions, in its premises, which are annually renewed, while it also collaborates with institutions in other countries. The museum's operation is financially covered partly by the income stemming from the educational activities it organizes, its gift shop, and the subscriptions of its members. Its versatile activities, however, would not have been realized without the financial support of foundations, banks, and companies. Recently, due to the bleak financial situation, all sponsorships and donations have been dramatically cut down, a fact that creates serious difficulties regarding the museum's activities. The museum does not receive any funds from public institutions, and although it is acknowledged by the Ministry of Culture and Ministry of Education, financial support has been occasional and symbolic. It is the Stavros Niarchos Foundation that has offered the most essential support to the museum since 1998, establishing a long-term collaboration throughout the years with donations, sustaining educational activities and address to socially excluded groups and school children. The aim of the Museum of Greek Children's Art Educational Programs is to offer all children the opportunity to participate in various individual and group activities that help them to become imaginative, creative personalities, active and involved in the environment they live in. 
The evaluation of teachers and parents confirm the quality of the activities, but most important, they constitute the key tool for constant amelioration. In my presentation, I would like to focus on the financial support by which the Stavros Niachos Foundation has continued to the museum's activities. And at this point, on behalf of the museum of our board, I wish to convey their gratitude and deepest thanks. In 1998, the Stavros Niachos Foundation sponsors the educational program for a whole school year, a day with dad. In 1999, the foundation sponsors an exhibition and a related educational program with children's artwork selected from the Refugee Reception Center in Lavrio. In 2000, the museum kit painting a tree was loaned for free, while all Easter art workshops were realized with the foundation support. In 2001, thanks to the foundation contribution to the museum, organizes activities both in Greece and abroad. In Greece, the foundation supported educational programs, material, and techniques. Abroad, in Strasbourg, it sponsored the educational program presented at the Council of Europe. Furthermore, the museum kit painting a tree was once again on loan free. In 2002, the same museum kit was loaned for free. That same year, the museum initiated a collaboration with the Sikiridion Foundation. In 2003, the museum organized, thanks to the foundation, workshops throughout the year and until 2006 for the Zanion Foundation for Children's Protection. In 2004, the foundation supports the program Traveling Through Art. And in 2005, in the program Images of Myself. The offer to socially outcast children is expanded to the Hadzikiriagian Foundation and lasts up to 2006. From October 2009 to June 2012, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation solely supported the program that was completed in two school years. This grant included the setting up of the exhibition, its catalog, and the carrying out of educational programs addressed to school pupils. Since 2011 was declared by UNESCO the International Year for Human Rights, the museum focused on the theme, A Child's Right to Expression, I Want To. The elevative exhibition followed in October 2010, presenting 116 artworks, and due to the social interest of the subject, the museum collaborated with six institutions for the protection of children and their rights. Along with the exhibition, a corresponding educational program was presented daily during the following two years. From February 2012 until the end of this year's school period, the Stavros Niarcho Foundation once more rose to the challenge of the financial crisis and decided to offer the school educational programs that are based on both on the museum exhibitions for free. For this major social offering, the world of children and the world of the arts are grateful. We would like to convey the children's enthusiastic response to the program since for many of those, the visit to the museum will be an unforgettable experience. Their teachers confirm that this free of charge participation in educational program is an extracurriculum opportunity rarely offered to their pupils. Identifying the non-promising turn in every Greek citizen's daily life the museum, thanks to the foundation support, completes its social offering for 2012 by providing free family frog programs on Sunday mornings. The parents' participation confirms the need for such offerings on a more regular basis. Acknowledging that parents have difficulties in raising even the smallest amounts requested in order for their children to attend an extracurricular activity the, the Museum of Greek Children's Art, relying on the donation of 90,000 
euros that the Stavros Niarchos Foundation granted for the next two years will continue to offer its educational programs for free to all public schools. It's more than certain that without the Foundation's donation, many children would have been deprived of their participation to such a program. The extremely difficult financial circumstances for the upcoming years deeply troubles the museum's management. Since January 2011, we have already proceeded in cutting down our staff salaries as well as minimizing our expenses. However, we, we still haven't been able to reduce the rent due to the owner's repeated refusal. The Stavros Niarchos Foundation's time enduring ethics, as well as its financial support to the museum, reinforces the effort made by the institution to continue the activity it started back in 1994, which is to provide children and their families with a space of culture and personal development that revolves around education. We firmly believe that we have lived up to the expectation of this collaboration by offering substantial work regarding the enhancement of children's education. And we hope to continue as fruitfully by maintaining the high level of educating children and pupils throughout their acquaintance with forms of art that are unavailable available at school and thus contributing to society with a museum school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for our speakers and presenters? Or any comments for the foundation as many of our grants were mentioned? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.